Oh, it's gonna. No wonder why we're gonna look like we're the insane ones. Well, you're all gonna look crazy because you're clothed and in your right mind. So yeah, well, uh, you're gonna be the nuts, yeah, nutty yeah, ones because you have clothes on. All I'm just, all I'm saying is, <laughs> you have clothes on. You're automatically gonna be weird. They're gonna be like, what's wrong with you people? Mm -hmm. With people being in cryopods, having their conscience loaded up to a mainframe. Oh, yes. That's been in almost all of the major games. Oh, I just used to watch that on movies. I don't remember video games with that, but I watched video movies with that. Games. Like in the 80s, it was movies. In the 80s and 90s, I watched all kinds of movies that did that. Remember all, I mean, remember all those? Some of you older people? Mm -hmm. If you remember some of those, that they were everything, what's that? Yeah, everything was about that. Like everything was about your brain, like total recall, all that stuff. Everything was about your brain being taken. And that was like back in the early nineties. I didn't know, I was like, whoa, that's weird. I mean, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, that's not real, that can't happen. And now like 20 years later, it's like they're doing it. <laughs> it's like, oh, it was real. They were telling you they were doing it. Yeah, yeah. So then when people tell me that like the queen of England eats babies, I'm like, yeah, I believe it. I believe that 90-year-old lady eats babies. I believe it. I know, sounds crazy. You're like, I'm, I, I just can't believe that. You can go home and tell your kids how crazy your pastor is. That's okay, it's, it's all right, you can do that. It's okay, but when it comes true and you find out really, it's like, okay, he was, I guess he wasn't so crazy, right? Because I talked about a lot of this stuff years ago. Years ago, I said, well, it's coming, man. These people are weird. These, and then, and I just, I, I tell you, just chalk it off. They're all devils. Just, just get over it and just look at them. They're, they're, they're just all a bunch of devils. Mm -hmm. Right? I said that 10 years ago. They're, they're just a bunch of devils. These politicians, they're, they're a bunch of devils. They got devils. They are devils. And they're going to sell you down the river. Every single last one of them. Yeah. And they have proven it right. Because right. no one moved the party more left than Donald Trump. No one. He brought all the sods in. He brought all the he brought all the kooks and the freaks in, and everybody was like, "Hey, if we win, it don't matter." Yep. Right. And he signed the very liberal stimulus money with no. He did, and also I just want the record to show again that I was right about this. That he's the one that he's the one that had Operation Warp Speed, and he's the one that brought the vax out, and now he's blaming Biden for, well, I wasn't going to mandate it, like Biden. Sure you weren't, bud. Yeah, you can, the states can lift the lockdowns, they'll just stop getting the $50 million a month from That we're giving them. Yeah, they can lift the lockdowns. There's such a bunch of crooks. I'm just, this is, this has been an announcement of Shattered Dreams Ministries, we'll move on now. I thought I'd just remind you of that, that they're all crooked, and uh, they're, they're going to mess you over. Okay, anyway. All right. So it's, it is going to get weird with all that stuff. It's going to get weirder. Like, we have, I've even begun to talk about, really, the demonic activity and what goes on with this metaverse. I mean, to the point of, like, what's really happening with it. Because it's, it's bad. I mean, they're... You have people now that are, they're offering drug like, okay, like I talked about on, on Tuesday in my broadcast, they're smoking toad venom. Yeah, and that toad venom, that toad venom makes them trip, right? It makes them trip, and it says it cures their depression, their anxiety, and it, and it changes their mind completely. I don't know. Ask Mike, uh, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson did it, and he said that's what made his turnaround three or four years ago where he's making money now, and he's, and he's back on track. Yeah. Toad juice? Yeah. He, no. He, he went and visited the toad. He said he died, and he was reborn. Yep. The toad showed him. The toad showed him life and death, and that life was, death was good. The toad showed him. I played a game when I was a kid, Battle Toads. That was, that was, that was. It does. I thought about that. I was looking into that, the spirit of frogs, you know, but it was a toad. So I was like, ah, maybe it's a dead end. I don't know. But uh, I, was, I was looking at it. Though. I, was like, I was looking into it. I was, trying to, I was trying to make a connection with it, but I just couldn't make it. But anyway, so there you go. So now uh, people are out there licking toads in the Sonora Desert. I don't know. Anyway, um, tripping out and running around. You better not have been doing that when you were out there in the desert somewhere. Do you be looking for any toads out there? But... Um, 
Oh, no, they were getting a lot worse than warts. They, it, I mean, it literally, like, they could see, they, they saw, I mean, they were, tri they were tripping, like, on, like, it's worse than LSD. It's a worse trip. And they smoke it. Like, a lot. It's crazier. Like, you can't imagine what it does to people. Like, seeing things that you're not supposed to see. It's bad. I, and that they're going to do that virtually. This is reality. Like, this is the world. Like, our children don't live this, thank God, and I hope they never do. But they need to be aware of it. They need to understand what's out there. They need to understand what the dangers are. Because this world is vastly different than what they're used to in this church and what their homes are like. It's vastly different. Yeah, it is. So we need to be prepared for that and prepare them for that so they know already. So somebody says, oh, you, do you know about this? And they look at him and say, yeah, I know what that is. Right? They need to. They need to be wise, be prudent, be able to hide themselves from the evil. Amen. Right? So they're not taken by surprise by it, but they know exactly what it is. This is why Christ warned us so much of these things in the end times. That's right. right? Listen on Friday to my broadcast if you can. I'm going to try to help some folks. I'm going to talk about uh, how Jesus uh, warned us that you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Yeah, and, and exactly what that means. And it took me all the way to the old. And by the way, it's also a remedy for despair. It's a remedy for de depression and despair because it, the Lord took me in that study this morning all the way into the Old Testament, back into the New Testament, all the way around. It's going to be a good study. Yeah, I think it will help some people to encourage them. That's what I want to do anyway. Acts chapter 20. Is Paul still freezing out there in the, or was he off? Did he get any, did they, in this cold? Oh, my. Well, I've been praying for him extra. Uh, about that and asking the Lord specifically on that to, to be with him in this weather. It's horrible. It's just too terribly cold out there for that. So um, keep praying for him. Keep praying for Brother Paul about that. That's very stressful and hard on the body. So we'll keep him in prayer. And keep Joy in prayer. She's been having some challenges at work as well. And... Uh, I told her to listen up on Friday, too. That'll help her. But um, Acts chapter 20, we're going to talk tonight. Uh, as I was looking at this, I thought it would be wise and prudent to deal with this uh, subject here uh, with the Apostle Paul. But also, and I, I've talked about it and sprinkled it into different messages, but I don't think as direct as this. I've had it in there, uh, but I thought about talking about, as it relates to this text, signs of an apostle. And the signs that Paul had, Paul's signs. I think it's important that, that we, we know these, that we are able to explain to people the signs of an apostle. Why? Well, you have the Roman Catholic Church that teaches that the Pope is the succession of, succession of Peter, right? He has the apostolic succession, and he is, he is part of that. You have them. You have the Charismatics that, that say that they have the apostolic gifts of healing and everything else like that, which were given to the apostles, Right? And, and if you don't know how to answer them, if, you're not, if you don't understand from the scriptures how to deal with them in a conversation, then you'll get messed up. You know, you'll get, you'll, you'll get confused and you'll get kind of wrapped up. And you'll be like, I don't know how to answer this guy. I mean, he's talking about the gifts. He's talking about tongues. He's talking about all this other stuff. And I, I don't know what to say to him. Or chances are a lot of times it's a bossy woman with a big mouth that's doing it. And, and her husband shuts up and has his tail between his legs in the corner there while his wife is, is blabbering on. I've had that happen so many times. And the woman's the bold one and she's sitting there running her big fat Jezebel mouth. And you can see I have no patience for that. I, I, I make no apologies about it and I have no patience for it at all. It's, just, it's absolute belligerent sin is what it is. And it's anti-Christ to the core. So I, I always like to deal with that spirit and, and kind of nail it. And, and by the way, if that makes you mad, that's your feminism showing, and you just need to repent of that. If you'll just get right with God, you won't hate that. See, you won't hate the roles that God, God's made women for and men for. You'll love it. You'll embrace it. 
If that seems too abrasive for you and too rough for you, well, you just need to ask God to forgive you and help you to have the right spirit to receive the truth and call a spade a spade. You need to be able to call an antichrist an antichrist, a devil a devil, and a Jezebel a Jezebel. You just need to be able to do that. If you can't do that, then you're wishy-washy and limp and you might have been in Minnesota too long. I don't know. But anyway, because where I come from, you just call a spade a spade, and that's just what it is. You just deal with what it is. And that's, and, and that's the truth of it. If that, makes a, if that makes a woman or a man mad, it really don't matter because it needs to be said. It needs to be dealt with. Those spirits and those, those people that have those religious spirits about them, they, 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 have, to be, they have to be preached down. By the way, there is so much rebellion in the heart of a child, right? The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of correction driveth it far from him. We already come with that foolishness bound in our hearts, right? We have it in us, and we have that rebellion to God's order in us, male or female. We already, we already, we already have it. It's in our flesh, right? And if we don't walk in the spirit, then we'll, we'll hate that type of bold preaching that calls that out. We'll hate that type of preaching that deals with that. And we'll, we'll kind of stiffen our necks and harden our hearts and say, you know what? I think you should have said it this way. Well, I just think you ought to obey God. Amen. Doesn't matter how I say it. You just need to obey God, right? And that the truth at the end of the day, you just have to be obedient to the Lord because you don't have to answer to me for it. It's not me you hate. It's not me you're mad at. It's God you're upset with because God put that order down if you're upset with it. Why do you think you could say it nicer? Why do you think you could just obey? <laughs> I didn't say you could obey God. That's what, that's what I mean. And if you, it wouldn't bother you as much, right? If you were right about it, it wouldn't bother you at all. That's the thing about feminism and those things. They kind of creep in, those spirits do. And if you're not careful, you'll give in to that. And you'll give in. There's a lot of pressure in this world for you, for these. All of you women here have a pressure in this world. And that pressure is for you to be a feminist. I mean, it is. It's for you to shake your fist. It's for you to get stiff-necked. It's for you to, and you see the example, right, Joy, at work all the time. You see it around you all the time. It's, it's everywhere in your environment. I mean, some of you men, see, that's the thing. Some of you men, I, I realize you have to work around these women, and you have to deal with them. Well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, because I don't play well with others. So, so, I, so I'm not saying that to brag. What I'm saying that is that I, I'm going to be straightforward about it. Like, I don't. I don't have to deal with any of them. And it, if they came to me, I'd, I'd say the same thing to them because I don't have to work with them. <laughs> I don't have to do that. That's not, and I, so I don't think you should go to work and do that. I don't think you should, I'm not saying you have to be, you should be me or anything like that or do what I do. God's called me to do that. There, 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 that's a special calling. And with that comes those protections, right? So you have to function and live and do that. And I have to stand up and be bold for the Lord and do what God's called me to do to empower you so you don't give in to those things, right. right? I don't even know why I'm talking about this because I really didn't have this in here, but it's just, I don't know, it's just that charismatic spirit and that Jezebel spirit, they're so aligned, they're so close together and they're so deceptive. If I just talk about something like that in a video and I throw it out there, you see effeminate men and angry women come and go, whoo. And they just jump on it. And I just stand back and I, I kind of laugh about it. I'm like, yeah, right. They make all their excuses about everything and all that. But the, at the, the bottom line is they don't like it. Why? Because it's God's order and they don't like it. They, they buck at it. Right? They don't love it like they should. Acts chapter 20, though, we're going to talk about the signs of an apostle. That was free. It didn't cost you anything. It wasn't part of the sermon. I don't even know where it came from. It must have been the Lord that let me say it. So there you go. Acts 20, verse number 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Boy, don't you fall asleep when the preaching's going on. You might just die. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. You know, they, they couldn't, I don't think any of them could go to sleep after that. The guy's dead. 
Paul lays down, he lays on his neck there, he, he wakes up, he, walk, he comes back to life, right? He resurrects him, which by the way was the sign of an apostle. That, that, was, that was one of the last signs, so to speak, of an apostle was that they would raise the dead, Amen. right? Peter raised the dead, his shadow, right, with the sickness and, and people would be raised from the dead, right? All those things. Well, Paul raises the dead. I think it's important how this happened, though, because uh, that, that's an interesting thing that we're going to get to in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the sermon here is talk about how that happened, because it is very interesting how it happened. It wasn't like it wasn't a glamorous thing in that sense, which we'll talk about. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, just bless it to our hearts tonight. Help it to get us right with you. And Holy Spirit of God, save the lost here. And strengthen the saved. Encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Number one, the signs of an apostleship. They are not glamorous signs like charismatics would have you to believe. I think it's important to note this, that the sign of an apostle, they were not some glamorous show at a charismatic healing revival. That's not what was going on here. The total perversion and lying wonders of the charismatics today have nothing to do with the scriptures, besides them being antichrist. They are liars and hypocrites and greedy men who wish to get wealthy off the people of God. Or fools. The apostles were not rich men that made tons of money. Were they? Though they have mansions in heaven as every blood-bought saint has, it is not appointed unto them to be rich here on this earth. Right? They weren't trying to mirror like Jesse was trying to mirror his life in heaven. You know, he said, well, my mansion here on earth, it ain't. They, people say I have a nice house here. It ain't nothing like what I have in heaven. You know, he's bragging about it. Right? These signs were not some bad episode of wrestling to show signs and wonders. They weren't some Barnum and Bailey's circus or some uh, Guinness Book of World Records show right. or Ripley's Believe It or Not. Amen. They were done from necessity and with great interest in the glory of God in heaven and not to put on a show. You know, the Antichrist, when he comes, he's going to put on a show. The same way those charismatics do. Turn to Revelation chapter 13, verse number 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, look, gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. If you look at this, what's going to happen in these end times, these miracles that you're going to see, they are the lying, they're the signs and the lying wonders. They are going to do miraculous things, but they aren't of Christ. They're going to be of Antichrist. God told us that was going to happen. He warned us not to be fooled by these things. And that's why Jesus said, don't seek a sign. By the way, you can be deceived from a sign. Don't seek a sign. Just right. believe God. Right. Believe in his written. You know what God's going to teach you through your life, your Christian life? After 20 years of my Christian life, the one thing that God drills into my head every day is, I, I, I want you to believe this. I just, I really want you to believe my word. Like, I don't, I don't want you to go somewhere else. I don't want you to reason it out. I don't want you to look somewhere else. I just want you to believe what I said. Believe it is written. I just want you to believe that. Pastor, it can't be that simple. You can't think that my afflictions and my troubles and everything else are really summed up in something so simple as you just need to trust the Lord. Yes, they are. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, you and I can't do anything else but trust God. We could sit and fret about it, but that just gets gray. Look, it doesn't work. <laughs> Look at this beard. It doesn't work. Right? You can just get gray, but it isn't going to do you any good. Right? It won't, won't fix anything. And some of you are too young to have gray hair, so don't be doing that. Right? Amen. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a, mouth, him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And then, of course, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, with all 
power. That's scary, right? With all power and signs and lying wonders. That doesn't say some power. That says all power. All power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I like this verse. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Right? These are the apostles, right? You know, the Bible tells us what the apostles, uh, what their uh, qualifications would be or what the signs of an apostle would be. You know, one of them is, is what, how people would view them as well. Lamentations 3, 345 is a prophecy. It says, thou hast made us as the offscuring and refuse in the midst of the people. That's what the apostles were. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. In 1 Corinthians 4, 9, through 12, it says, For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even until this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, just like Christ. That's not you and I. We have families, we have homes, we, we live in society, we plant churches, we continue on, we raise children, right? Grandchildren. That wasn't the life of the apostles. That's not what they did. That's the difference. There is a difference in the apostles and you and I. Absolutely. And let the record show that God never ordained one female apostle. Yeah, you're supposed to say amen to that. <laughs> Some of you, will, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> whoo. <laughs> Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. Where did he get that from? We got that from Lamentations. That's where it came from. We are the, and the offscoring of all things unto this day. This was the life of an apostle, and none of us have it. There may have been men that have suffered like they did, but they don't have the signs of an apostle that was given to them directly. If you look at the life of the apostles as we looked at them in the paths, their death, it's not like the rich charismatics today, is it? You know, there were some men in the South and at different times that called men the apostle of the South or different things of that nature. When the Baptists did it, they referred to them being sent from God and seeing the power of God. They didn't mean any apostolic succession, of course. They never espoused any of those things. Their lives, uh, in the strictest sense of the word, were not, they were not apostles in that sense. But they didn't have any apostolic signs and wonders. But some men called them that. But the phony charismatics today, they teach it as if they have the same gifts of healing, and they call themselves apostles, some of them, right? Paul warned us about those false apostles, though, in 2 Corinthians eleven twelve. But what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles. They'll be here. Just like false brethren crept in unawares. We've met those. For such are false apostles, apostles deceitful workers. They're deceitful. Transforming themselves. That's right, they're workers. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, but we do. <laughs> every time the Bible says marvel not, every time we do. Every time. Don't you? Okay, I'll give you an example. Marvel not at the world hates you. And then you go to work and people hate you and you're like, I don't understand. Why do they hate me? He just said marvel not if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. They hated me without a cause, right? I mean, 
Jesus said that, but you, just, you, you still marvel at it. You wonder at it. Why are these people? I do it too sometimes. I'm like, why does this dude hate me so much? I mean, that guy says people send me the most awful, wicked, I can't even speak in mixed company, things that people have sent me in the mail. And I wouldn't either. It's nasty. I mean, things that, I like, I was so, in, I was so upset. I, Dad, you were with me that day. I was so upset when something was sent to me in the mail by a, a very wicked man that was stalking me for a while till I gave him my address and then he quit stalking me. I don't know what the deal was with that. That was weird. He kept saying, he kept doing like the spooky stuff. He'd like text me and say, oh, I'm, I'm going to find your new address. I'm going to find it. I, I, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to find your address and you have no idea what I can do to you. And I said, you don't have any idea what my God can do to you. Like, you don't have any idea. I ain't afraid of you. What, what are you going to do to me? You can't do nothing to me but give me a promotion. What are you going to do, kill me and send me to heaven early? Amen. Right? What are you going to do to me? And he kept saying that over and over again. And I really believe the Lord just impressed him. Well, just give him the, the address to your church, and he can show up there since he's looking for you. Amen. So I did. I just said, here's the address, 1030 Highway 3 South, Northfield, Minnesota. I'm there every Sunday and Wednesday. Come see me. Look me up. I'm there. I ain't hard to find. Everybody knows where I'm at. Right? He never showed up. Why? Because God didn't let him. That's why. Amen. God turns their mind to mush, by the way. He does. Don't you ever forget it either. God will do it. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. But you marvel, don't you? You marvel when, when every time God says marvel not, that's why he told you to marvel not. Right. Because you do. We do. He tells you that on purpose. Like it wasn't an like he didn't put that in there for an accident. He put that in there because he knew you were going to marvel. Why are these people so mad at me? I can't figure out why these people hate me. You run around, can't figure out why people hate you at work. Why are they mad at me? All I do is doing my job. What, what? Well, that ain't why they hate you. They don't hate you because you're doing your job. Right? They don't, they don't hate you for that reason. They don't even know why they hate you. They just hate you. That's how they treat Christians many times. They, they, just, they just hate them, and they don't know why. They can't figure out. I don't know what it is, but I just hate you. <laughs> they just can't figure it out why they do, right? They, they can't. You see the rage in them, and you're like, well, man, it's right. right? Especially if they notice you dress different. You don't, you, don't, you don't go to their parties. You don't drink their booze. You don't go hang out with them. So what are they? They don't like you. They know you're different, Amen. right? So they, they don't like you, but you marvel at it. You shouldn't marvel at it. Right? We should just believe God. God said it. They're going to do it. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So, God said there's going to be false workers that come in. They're deceitful workers. There's going to be false apostles. There's going to be false workers, false brethren. You're going to deal with all these people. That's going to happen. They're going to transform themselves. I can say I know that's true. By the word of God, number one, and by experience, number two. Amen. But this destroys the notion of apostolic succession, be it the charismatics who believe in it or the dirty old pervert sitting on the papal throne in Rome, that lying Jesuit devil claiming to be an apostle Amen. when he's not, but he's antichrist, just like he came out for same-sex civil unions today, and the head of the UN thanked him because the Pope promoted same-sex civil unions. I mean, he's a Jesuit. What do you expect, right? They're devils. But you know what we should really talk about is, the t is, is what that means, the office of the apostle. So if you know what the real is, you won't be fooled by the fake. Now, David Cloud has a good section there. Without apology, I use it because it's very good. He's got some good information, some facts that he's gathered. You do well to use different resources like that. By the way, you know, you, did you know that you don't have to like somebody to learn from them? Like, you don't really have to. You, you don't have to like them. You don't even have to agree with them all the time to learn something from them. Right. I've learned things from people that I don't really like. <laughs> I mean, I they're kind of mean. I don't, I don't like them that much. But, but I've learned from them if it's a good resource, right? I mean, I wouldn't go to half of the people's churches of books that I've read. 
I wouldn't go to their churches. Are you kidding me? They sprinkle babies, some of them, all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff. And you might say, well, I only learn from people that I agree with 100%. Well, you ain't learning from too many people then. Right. You won't learn from too many people like that because you don't agree with anybody 100%. You don't even agree with yourself 100%. Do you? Right? So you got to learn. From, it's okay to learn from people. Signs of an apostle. What does that mean? Number one, apostles were sent forth. That's the first definition. The apostle means one who is sent or a messenger. Now, there are three usage of the terms apostle in the New Testament. One, I, I think this is so cool. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. One is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I think this has got to be, by the way, this again proves the deity of Christ. This is so absolutely cool. And if you're paying attention, you'll like this a lot. Um, Hebrews chapter 3. Oops, that's two. That won't work. Verse one. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle. So if Jesus is an apostle, he is always the apostle. That's right. Right? If he's, if he's the lion of the tribe, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Right? Jesus is always capitalize when it comes to titles that are given whatever he falls under if he is a king he is the the king of kings and lord of lords no matter where it is wherever jesus is what office he holds that's who he always is always capitalized why because he's the head of all things and by him all things consist right that's why so what it says here is wherefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Christ Jesus. He's the high priest of our profession. He's the apostle. He is the sent one. Why? Because he was sent from the bosom of the Father. That's why. He was sent from God. Before any of the other apostles were sent, Jesus Christ was sent. Right? He is the apostle. He comes from God, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Right? Jesus was sent from God, the Father, into the world to provide redemption for mankind. That's the perfection of the King James Bible. Because there's only one apostle that is capitalized in all 83 references. Amen. And it's Jesus Christ. That's the perfection of the King James Bible. You say, I don't know if I believe all that capitalization stuff. And I don't know if I believe all of that, that number stuff in the Bible. Well, you should. Amen. It's pretty plain. It's not an accident. That right. book is perfect. Amen. Like God did that on purpose. Right. Absolutely. There's only one that's capitalized like that. That's Jesus. Whatever office he holds, he is always better than any other. And look where that is. It's in the book of Hebrews. And the whole book of Hebrews is Jesus Christ better than all in everything better than all. If he's the high priest, he is the high priest, and he is better, a yeah, better high priest, right? Better covenant. Yeah. Better, sacrifice. better sacrifice. Better tabernacle, that's right. Better than Moses, right? Yep. right? All of those things. What, that's what the whole book of Hebrews outlines. Better. Jesus is always better than all. Amen. I like that, don't you? Amen. That's good stuff. Number two, apostle refers to the 12 men who were chosen by Christ to lay the foundation of the church. Turn to Luke chapter 6. It's good to understand this. You know, you understand that not everybody could raise the dead. Back then even. These charismatics would have you believe that everybody was walk, running around healing everybody. Every believer, every believer has the power to heal somebody, right? That's what they were making everybody, that's what the charismatics try to get you to believe. You can do that too. Come here and let me slap you on the forehead. Right? And then you'll be able to heal people. Garrett, come here, I'll smack you. <laughs> <laughs> no way. There's only there's only one, there's only room for one anointing. Okay, I, I watched that. T.D. Jake showed me that. There's only Luke chapter six, verse number thirteen. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. So of the disciples, he chooses twelve 
he named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealots, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also, which also was the traitor. <laughs> what a way to be known. <laughs> which also, by the way, was the traitor. Right? They list him last there. That wasn't on purpose, was it? Now look at Ephesians 2.20. There was a purpose for the apostles. These sent ones. These specific ones that were ordained by Jesus. It, takes, it talks about the church here, verse number 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. That's the church, right? And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay, so it says here that the church was founded, the institution of the church is founded on Jesus Christ and the apostles. Well, the foundation is already laid. Paul said you couldn't lay another one. You're building on the foundation now, but you can't lay another one. The foundation's already been laid. See, Jesus laid that foundation. It was on him and the apostles. You can't add another apostle. You can't, there's, the foundation's already laid. Now there's much on top of it now, right? Right. It's sad, isn't it? How deceived people are by this. After Judas betrayed the Lord and hung himself, the 11 remaining apostles selected a man to replace him. Acts 1. We know about that, right? We studied that when we were doing Acts about, I don't know, three years ago, whatever it was. Who's counting? Right? Hey, it's a history book. It takes a long time to get through, okay? Acts chapter 1, right? And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names together were about 120 men and brethren. The scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Now, by the way, this is important for you to understand that when they were casting those lots and everything else for this other one, that this was already prophesied of the Holy Ghost that this would take place. Right. So he, they're just all they're doing is fulfilling the will of God. That this was already this was already set in motion. That's why some people say, "Oh, they must have jumped the gun and all this stuff because they they chose." No, that was of God for them to choose him. Amen. Paul was a separate issue altogether. He was a separate issue altogether for a purpose and a reason, right? For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Boy, that's pretty graphic right there, isn't it? And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem in so much as that the field is called in their proper tum, tongue, Alkadama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, there you go, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein, and his bishop prick let another take. Well, what was the bishop prick? That was the apostleship. Let another take, right? So he, that, that was according to the Lord. And then we find out who, who was ordained to do that there and that they laid hands on them. And, that's, and he was a witness, which we'll get to also uh, in a little while here. But that's what happened there. Later, we find that Paul was selected directly by Christ to be an apostle. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. See, the Bible uh, tells us, the scriptures tell us, and Paul gives his testimony, by the way, that no one... No one of the apostles argued with. Now, people always challenge Paul's apostleship. Yes. Always. always. Right? They tend to do that with authority. They like to challenge it. Right? In my ministry, ever since I, I've been a pastor, I think the phrase that I've heard the most, you call yourself a pastor. <laughs> yeah. They say that all the time, challenging it, challenging it, right? Challenging authority. Satan challenges it. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, he sure does. He likes to do that. Uh, let's see, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also. As one born out of due time. Jesus Christ came to Paul and gave him the revelation. Jesus Christ came visibly, physically 
to Paul. Right? For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which is, was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Amen. Paul said, I labored more abundantly. I worked harder than all of them did. No, I was respect. He was, had less respect than they did from people. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's going to talk about that again. Verse number 11. Paul says in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been compelled... I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and in mighty deeds. So Paul says, look, I, I mean, I, I showed you the truth. Galatians chapter 1, straight over here, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Amen. Paul makes sure they understand that. So, so you have the apostles that were ordained, then you have by Jesus, then you have Paul who was called by Jesus. Jesus came specifically and gave the revelation to. People say, I don't know, how do we know that Paul really had that? Well, here's what we know. Paul was murdering people. He was murdering Christians, and all of a sudden, he saw that bright light of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. God stopped him dead in his tracks saved his soul, and turned him completely around. That is the gospel. That's the grace of God. That's what that is. And then showed, it, showed the signs of an apostle in him, right? In that sense. The third use of that word apostle refers to Christian workers in general. Does not, uh, it doesn't uh, mean any, any of the apostolic gifts or anything like that, but just being a sent one. Turn to Acts 14 and verse number 14. It says here, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. You, you know, Paul was a, he was a worker with him. Philippians 2.25 There. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion, labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. It's the same word. It's not used here, in, uh, but it's the same meaning of the word him being a sent one, right? It means that he was sent out. Just a worker, right? He was sent. Um, a messenger, a minister. So when you see that, those words are very similar to an apostle, okay? Uh, very similar word, just kind of like a, a minister in the Bible doesn't always mean a pastor. It doesn't always mean it means you, we're all ministers. We're all to be ministers of reconciliation, right? That's not just the pastor, but that's all of us as ministers of reconciliation. You can shut those three off now. It's probably hot enough in here. They are off. Are they? Yeah. Okay, because I, I turned that up to like 65. I don't know what I put it on. But um, anyway, um, they just froze up on you. Is that what they did? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so marks of the 12 apostles, that's what we should talk about real quick. Number one, they were chosen personally by Christ. Acts 22. Acts 22. Got you moving around your Bibles tonight so you don't fall asleep or anything. We got you. It'll be like Eutychus, except you won't fall very far if you do, but... Right? Acts 22, verse 14. That's right. You'll wake up real quick. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Look at that also capitalized. Just one. That is only of Jesus Christ. It is twice in the King James Bible. The just one, right? That just one. That, 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 that title is for Jesus Christ. He is the just one. You and I are just in Christ, right? A just man, the Bible talks about. That's us. 
but he is the just one, right? He is that just one. So uh, whenever it refers to Christ, you can see that there. Acts chapter 22, let's see, uh, verse 14. Uh, let's see, Luke chapter 6, we talked about that already, we won't go into that. Galatians chapter 1, we talked about that. They were chosen by Christ. They had seen the resurrection, right? Acts 22, 14, uh, Acts 1, 22, we talked about that. They were witnesses, right? In Acts chapter 1, we'll go back there quickly. Acts chapter 1, verse number 22. An apostle had to be a witness of the resurrection, of Jesus Christ in that sense, beginning from the baptism of John, under that same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Of course, Paul is one that was out of due time, right? And he was chosen by the Lord in that sense. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, I think it's Corinthians, let me see here. Yeah, Paul says in verse 1, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So Paul is, is given his credentials there, right? And of course, we talked about uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, 9 when he talked about that. They received their message by direct revelation from God rather than being taught by man. Go to Galatians chapter 1 and you'll see that. Amen. Paul said, I didn't receive it of man. Neither did the apostles. They received it right from Jesus Christ. Remember when he came into the room? Peace be unto you. Yep. Right? Well, Paul's the same way. Paul was sitting there all of a sudden. Here comes Jesus to him, right? He's on the road to Damascus. That's not the only time Jesus appeared to him. He appeared to him again. And maybe another time after that, a few times, he did appear to him. Maybe three. I can't remember exact number. But Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 11 through 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man. Neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that I, beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul says, look, I didn't receive it of man. I got it straight from God. You and I can't say that. We did receive the gospel. We're, we're witnesses of the gospel. We, we received it of man. right? Paul says that he received it of God. God came through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, apostles had the power to impart spiritual power and gifts to others. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse number 17. Remember, we talked about this. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Oh, sorry, Simon, that won't work. Uh, Simon the sorcerer. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 is another example. Paul talked about the gift. He said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He wanted him to stir that gift up, right? It was the power of God that they had power to give, impart spiritual power and gifts to others. They had special signs to authenticate their ministry. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 12, we talked about this. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is, what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except that it be that I myself was not burdensome to you. Forgive me this wrong, he said. Acts 2.43 talks about the power that they had, right, that the apostles had. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. God set them forth to do that. 
Acts 4.33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Acts 5.12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. See the pattern? By the way, they had the same authority as the Old Testament prophets. Look at 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 2. That you may be mindful, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Same, same authority. He lists the prophets of old, their authority, and the apostles' authority. No man today has the authority of an apostle. By the way, they wrote scripture, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 and 16. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our brother, beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. And also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Not an accident. He says Paul's writings are scripture. Amen. Right? So people that have a problem with Paul's writings, Peter said they're scripture. Mm -hmm. See? See how that works? Right there. So the question must be asked, are there apostles today or can there be? For the following reasons, we know that there were not apostles. There are no more apostles today in the same sense as those 12 chosen men and then the apostle Paul. Number one, no one qualifies to be such an apostle today, right? We know what the qualifications are. We've never seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead. He never came to us. We believe what the gospel says, but he never came visibly to us, right? That was a qualification to be an apostle. Right? We talked about that. There were only 12 of them, and their office, apart from the exception of Judas, was never passed on to any other. When Judas committed suicide after betraying Jesus, the 11 remaining apostles had to find a replacement immediately, right? Because of the prophecy that went out and because of the command of the Lord. They understood the significance of that number 12. They were, they were, 12, they were to the 12 tribes of Israel, right? That's who they were, and they were one representing each tribe. Later, Paul was called, right? We understand that, but after that, there were no others. The first apostles were called to lay the foundation of the church, which we talked about. The foundation has been firmly laid. And those men with their special authority, calling, and sign gifts passed. Right? They're gone. They're in heaven now. No New Testament passage instructs the churches to select or to ordain apostles. Nowhere are there directions of how to ordain an apostle. Right. There are two offices in the local church, right? There is the office of the bishop and the office of a deacon. We see a pattern of the office of a deacon was upon necessity for most of the time. Amen. It was needed, and that's when they ordained them, right? But the office of a pastor and the office of a, uh, of a deacon are the only two that we find. We don't find an office of, of uh, the apostle. We don't have that anywhere. It's not in the Bible for us. It's not in there. So there's no directions. Surely if God wanted us to ordain apostles, he would tell us how. Right? right? There's, no, there's no directions in the scriptures for that. Why? Because it's not possible. Right? That's right. They have the cardinals do it now, right? The standard used to select the replacement for Judas proves that the office of the apostle could not have continued. The standard required that the apostle had been with Jesus during his earthly ministry. Remember that? They had been with him. They had one that was with them that was a partaker. So you understand that whenever, if a man would claim to be an apostle, he would have to have proof from the scriptures, and we have no reason to believe him. Because the Bible doesn't even tell us that that was possible. They're the last ones. Now we come to Paul and Eutychus here. Here we find the Apostle Paul preaching until midnight. And we find this young man, Eutychus, falling asleep. Aren't you glad you're not on a loft in the air? You're not drowsy like that? Right? 
You know, sometimes people fall asleep during preaching. That's that that does happen, by the way. That's not that's not a new thing. It, it isn't a new thing. I used to think, man, that's pretty bad when somebody falls asleep when you're preaching. But then when it happened to Paul, I figured it must not be too bad, right? <laughs> must not be. If if Paul had people fall asleep, then man, uh, I'm probably going to have it happen too, right? It, it'll it'll definitely happen, right? But I think it's good food for thought for us to think about our little ones. You know, they they it's pretty normal for them to fall asleep, not to be too hard on them when they're real small like that. I'm not talking about when they get older and they're old enough to understand things, but some of them are little, you know, they're, you, what do we expect from them, right? Uh, they're children, you know, but you and I ought to think very, very soberly about us being awake, you know, and us being alert and us listening very carefully and being attentive to what we hear, right? As a, as a good example to them and to others, right? That, that we would be careful not to, not to uh, be lax in that, right? I think that Eutychus, I think if he's probably my son's age, you know, probably fell asleep up there listening and boom, he just falls off the loft there. And uh, that must have been pretty scary. Could you imagine being in that room and all of a sudden Paul's preaching away and you hear thud and you hear it from the third floor, thud. And that's a nasty sound when you hear somebody fall like that. I, uh, my daughter, Mandy, fell off the bunk bed one time face first, and you could hear it when she fell. And it was bad. It was bad. And so I know, I know that, that, that sound is very eerie. Could you imagine that? And then the Apostle Paul comes up, right? I think there's a picture there, though, of something we ought to pay attention to. Spiritually, of course, that you and I ought to be careful not to be sleepy saints. We ought to be careful to be alert. I don't mean just when you're listening to preaching, but I mean in your own Christian walk in your life, not to be a sleepy saint, but to be paying attention diligently to your walk with God, to be paying attention diligently to what's going on around you, right? To being an alert Christian. The Bible says it is high time for us to awake out of sleep. Don't walk around, and I don't mean tired, I'm talking about spiritually here. Don't walk around as, as kind of a, a drowsy Christian that is sleeping your way through this world. You've got to be alert, and you've got to be paying attention. You've got to be vigilant. You have an adversary. The devil is a roaring lion, and he, Satan wants to catch you up. Whatever you're doing, whether you're, you could be a young lady here and he wants to catch you up. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to destroy your life. You could be an old man and he wants, he wants to see you disgraced in your last days. Right. Do you understand that? You could be a young man and Satan wants to see you trip up, lose your testimony and ruin your life forever. He wants to. He wants that to happen to you. The devil wants you to, to uh, be sleeping when you're supposed to be alert and paying attention. You can be a mother not, not paying attention to your duties. And you can fall asleep at the wheel and not look around and see what's really going on around you. And paying attention to your children and paying attention to, their, to what they're doing and how they're acting. Right? You can be a husband and not fulfilling your duty and sleeping through your duties as a husband, not paying attention to what's going on in your home, not paying attention to your wife, possibly, if she's discontent with some things and not dealing with those things. Yeah, see, that you'd be sleeping through those things. Better be careful. God laid it on my heart to say that to you, that you ought to be careful about that, not be sleepy. You know, you can't be at war and war, a good warfare, and be on your guard if you're sleeping. There's no time for Christian coldness. Amen. You got to have warm, hot, fiery zeal for God. And you got to be alert, and you got to be ready, and you got to be paying attention. You got you to watch what you're doing. Pay attention. Pay attention to your home. Pay attention to your children. Pay attention to their actions. Pay attention to your, your wife and your family. Pay attention in your... Take heed to your own self. Take heed to yourself. How can you take heed to others if you're not taking heed to yourself? Paying attention to your own walk with God. Praying for your family. Praying for your church. 
understanding what's going on around you, not squandering and wasting your time and your life on garbage and stupidity. Youth is wasted on the young many times, but it doesn't have to be. You can be alert. You can be, you can be on guard. You can be paying attention. You can be uh, vigilant in your, in your life. Young people, now is the time for you to be diligent. Now is the time for you to pay attention. Now is the time for you to walk the straight and narrow. Now is the time for you to be careful and cautious because the devil wants to trip you up and destroy your life. He wants to take your purity and defile you. That is what he wants to do. That, that, that is what he wants to do. He wants you to give in to your own temptations, give in to your discontent, give in to those things and destroy your life. He absolutely wants that. And that's why you have to be, you have to be diligent and you have to be vigilant. You say you're trying to scare me. I hope so. I hope I am. But more importantly, I hope the Holy Ghost of God does and wakes you up so you're alert and you're paying attention to what's going on, that you're, that you're focused in the right place, that you're, that you're sober-minded and, 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 and centered on what you need to be. Because Satan wants to destroy you. He absolutely does. I want you to think about this for a second. You know, you think about, just throw this out there, you think about serial killers, right? Look down at your baby in that car seat. You couldn't imagine that little baby growing up to be a serial killer, could you? You couldn't imagine it. I couldn't imagine it. I look at my son back, I couldn't imagine it. Well, let me tell you something. You don't raise them right or you let them raise themselves and you don't pay attention to what they're doing and you don't teach them, they may not be a serial killer, but they'll break your heart just as bad as if they weren't. You better have the hard conversations with your children. Because I guarantee you, I'm going to, from this pulpit, I'm going to bring up a ton of stuff. And if you're uncomfortable with it, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Because I'm going to bring it up so it tests them and tries them. And if you don't do your job, I'm going to do mine. Amen. I'm going to do mine. Because I have to answer to God for it. So I'm going to warn them. I'm, I'm going to warn them. I'm going to say that. And then they're going to go home and say, pa what's pastor talking about? And you're going to have to explain it to them, what pastor's talking about. Amen. And you're going to have to have that talk with them. You're going to have to warn them and protect them. And you're going to have to teach them. Listen, I don't have time to get on this now, but I, I will later. Well, maybe I do. But here's, here's the thing. Let, let me say this to you. Your children have all sorts of confusing thoughts that go through their mind and their hearts. They just do. And sometimes those things are very uncomfortable. Like they don't know how to say that. They don't know how to talk about that. They don't know how. They're afraid of it. They're afraid of some of the things that go through their mind. Have you ever been there? You don't have to raise your hand. But have you ever been there? You just have some stuff go through your mind, right? You get, you're afraid of it. You don't like it. It's uncomfortable. It's scary to you. It's frightening. And when you're a young person like that, it, something to do with the hormones and all kinds of other stuff that's going on as you're growing up, that's why children have to be guided because they have all kinds of scary thoughts in their mind. And you know what they need you to do by the power of God? They need you to take this book and they need you to parent them and they need you to explain to them that it's not that crazy and they're gonna be just fine and they'll get through it. And you'll help them. And to guide them through those years. Not just to leave them themselves and be uncomfortable to have conversations with them. I'm really burdened when I pray I, I, I'm burdened for some of you. I, I think about you and I, I pray for these young people and I pray for some of them. And, and, and I, I understand by the things that I've been through in my life, I understand that they're going through some things and they're afraid about some things and they're, they're, they're challenged by some things and they're, they're afraid about what, what they could do or what they want to do or, or their feelings and their emotions and everything else like that. They're, they're afraid of some of those things. And you know, a lot of churches you can go to, they, 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 oh, we don't want to touch that stuff. The youth pastor just wants to play Skippy Doodah games with them yeah. and do all that fun stuff with them. Right. Let's run around and shoot Nerf guns at each other. Well, I'd like to shoot you too, but that's, and I'm pretty good at it, by the way. Just ask some guys that used to be here. But anyway, um, <laughs> I can hit him in the head every time. Um, but the point is, and I, I'm not afraid to do that with you. I like to have fun too. But the point is, is that you need to talk about, like those things need to be talked about as these children. God's showing me, hey, you know what? <laughs> You're, you ain't going to be a youth pastor, but you are going to pastor the youth. Yeah. 
Amen. That's what God told me. Right. It ain't up to anybody else to pastor these youth. It's up right. to me. I'm their Amen. pastor. And, that's, and I'm going to pastor them. Amen. Right? That, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to pastor you and I'm going to pastor them. Amen. Right? Because they need it. Why? Because I, I, I understand what Satan wants to do to them. And God's made me very sensitive. You see, about five years ago, when my brains melted like an egg on a side, like an egg frying on a sidewalk, God showed me one thing. Hey, preacher, you know why this happened? You see those kids right there? Satan wants those kids. He wants every single one of them, and he wants to destroy them. Amen. And God showed me that. It took me a while to understand that, and I said, well, over my dead body... Because I told the sorry little devil that wanted to be here that said, that said the same thing to me. I said, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Not a chance. Amen. And I mean it. Amen. I'll fight for every last one of them. And I mean it. And if you don't fight, I'm fighting. You, just read, you might not fight, but I'm going to fight. And I hope you're fighting with me. But I'll pray the Amen. Holy Ghost of God. I'll get the power of God and, and, and I'll fight. But I ain't giving up. I ain't giving up on one of them. If you go astray, I'm going to go looking for you. Amen. I will go looking for you. You can be in the dirtiest, rotten gutter. I've been there. I'll find you. I'll go look for you there. Amen. I ain't kidding either. You might think I'm kidding. You think you're stubborn? You ain't met stubborn. I'm stubborn. Amen. God made me Praise stubborn. God. He made, remember when I got called to this ministry, God, God told me the verses he gave me. I made your forehead stronger than their foreheads. I, all the way back before I ever knew I was going to have to butt heads like that. Amen. He said, I made it stronger than their foreheads. Uh-huh. Amen. That's why we got to be stubborn in prayer. You know... I'm going to close with this because i got to get going. I wasn't planning on saying some of this extra stuff, but that's okay. You know, you and I, we have the power of God today, but we have it a different way. We have it in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God and salvation. We're not apostles. The foundation of the church has been laid. We add to the spiritual building now. We're built on top of them. But we do have power today. As a preacher, I have the power of the Holy Ghost to be a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ is, uh, Christ is not, uh, has not called us to be faith healers in that sense, but to preach to men of their lost souls that they need to be saved by the grace of God, to show them that they can be resurrected from the dead. We are witnesses of the resurrection. My life is a witness of Christ raising the dead. Do you understand that? I mean, my life is a witness of that. The way that I was heading and the place that I was headed before I was saved was hell. Do you understand that? Hell on earth here is worse as it could get, and hell afterwards for all of eternity. That's, that was the road that I was on, right? And Jesus Christ, I, I know what it's like to have that, that, that uh, road to Damascus meeting with Jesus. I know what that's like to have Jesus turn me completely around the other way. I know what that's like. I know what that is. Jesus did it for me. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm preaching to you today, because I was that guy. I was going that way, and Jesus turned me. Amen? He brought me to repentance and faith, and now we are, resu we are witnesses of that resurrection. Like, I I'm, I'm not preaching tonight because this is a good gig, and I don't have anything to do. Right? Like, you know, I mean, I love what God, I'm preaching because Christ saved my soul. And he changed me and he called me into the ministry. And he said, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And I'm going to empower you. And I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I will be with thee through all your trials and everything. And you will prove me in your life. By the way, you know one of the verses that, that when I was coming, after I got saved and when I was coming, or it may have been before I was saved, I can't remember. But there was one verse I remember sitting at an altar. And I wasn't even right with God at that time really with what I was, you know, I was confused about some things and all that. But the one verse Jesus uh, it just sent out to me that I couldn't forget, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And there have been some things, that's for sure. But he's still worth it. Right? Listen to me. 
Every one of you, have, as blood-bought saints of God, you have the power to preach the gospel. You have the power to witness to your friends and neighbors. You have the power to preach the gospel, to see men saved by the grace of God. You have that power. Now, you may not, you may not have that power to pastor or to do those things because God gives gifts. That's a pastor's a gift. You, you may not have that. You don't need it. If God didn't call you to it, you won't need it. But he'll give you power. He gives us the power of the gospel, right? Whatever place God has put you, if you're saved here tonight, you've been given that power to preach the gospel. Whether you're a mother, you've been given the power to preach the gospel. Whether you're, whether you're a father, you've been given that power to preach the gospel. Right? But if you're not saved, then you don't have the power of God. You're doomed to hell for all of eternity. Because you're a sinner that has not been raised from the dead. See, Jesus doesn't only save people. He not only justifies them. He leaves them the evidence of sanctification. Do you understand that? That's part of their salvation. He actually sanctifies them. That doesn't mean they're perfect, but he never leaves them without that evidence that he did a work in their heart. It's not sinless perfection. (laughs) But what it is, it's his sanctifying power. Right? Right? And God shows us that evidence when he saves us. He shows us the longer we're saved, right? One of the things that God kept through the, through the darkest time of my life, one of the things that God kept drilling into my, my heart was, I, I mean, I, I've never left you. I mean, I mean you, you, you never went off into sin. I never delivered you over to your enemies. I, I, I never let you go, Right? And I've looked at that and I've said, God has never let me go. He has never withheld his power of protection over me. He has never allowed me to fall into that, to fall into sin and to live there and to be taken by sin's sway. He has kept me from evil. And that is the power of God unto salvation. Why? Because that's the power of the resurrection. That's what it is. It is a mighty power of God to raise the dead. It's what it is. And thank God for it. In one sense, I am an apostle tonight, not not with apostolic power or claims of that authority, but one that's been sent to preach the gospel to you. One that's been empowered with the power of God to preach salvation. Is your soul saved tonight? Have you been raised from the dead spiritually as Eutychus was raised bodily? All those that have been raised from the dead spiritually by faith in Christ are promised one day to be raised bodily. I'm not a faith healer in the sense of their understanding, but faith does heal, does it not? Mm. One day. I fulfilled my duty, but have you fulfilled yours? Have you believed the gospel? I think about that, oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. Can you remember it? The day that Jesus raised you from the dead, the day that he saved your soul, the day that he raised you from the dead, the day that he changed your life and made you a new creature, old things that were passed away and all things are become new. You sure aren't perfect, but you sure do want to be. Right? I think about that, how God lifted me, how love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. If you, if you don't have that day, you need it. You don't need a day. You need Jesus. Amen. By the way, I look around and I see the signs that Jesus, of what Jesus did, how he saved my soul and the fruit of that. I see that not only in my own life, but in this church. I just, just think about that for a second. There was no biblical church here 15 years ago. Think about that and what the Lord has done and the fruit of what God has done. Right. Think about that. Paul said, the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Seven times that phrase, my joy is in the Bible, right? Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. That's what God's called you to tonight. I look at you and you are my joy and my crown. This is my work. This is my life's work. You are. And I intend to fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to fight a good fight, to finish my course and to keep the faith. 
2 Corinthians 13, 4 will be done. You all got to get home. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. God still has the power to raise the dead. God still uses preaching to raise the dead. If you're dead here tonight, He'll raise you by the power of the gospel from the dead. If you're lost and dead in your sins, you can cry out to Christ and He will save your soul and forgive you of your sins. If you are saved, you ought to believe and trust God. Every day, you ought to believe in that power of the resurrection. You ought to believe in that power that God has given you. Amen. As children of God, as sons and daughters of God, you ought to believe God. You ought not doubt Him. You ought to believe Him. And you ought to trust Him. If you haven't trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, you ought to turn to Him today. Hell is hot, but heaven is sweet. And Jesus Christ paid it all for you. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the preaching of the cross. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for changing my life all those years ago. Thank you for breathing life into me, Lord, and giving me truth. Thank you for sustaining me through all things. And thank you for your people here, Lord. Each, many of them have the testimony, Lord, that Jesus Christ resurrected them from the dead, brought them up, Lord, and saved their souls and made them new creatures. God, if there be one that does not, or two or ten, Lord, save their souls tonight in Jesus' name. And Lord, if there be others that need strengthened in their hearts to understand what what the true power of God is. Lord, we're not apostles in the sense of the 12 apostles, but Lord, we are sent to go out and preach the gospel. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful in our families as mothers and fathers and, and as children, faithful children. Help us to be lights and witnesses in this world. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.